Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series, Jesus, the King Who Came to Die, a study of the Gospel of Mark. This dynamic, fast-paced book gives the story of Jesus the Messiah, God's Son, the King, who came to suffer and die to save His people. We hope this helps you understand and apply God's Word in your life today. Well, we're going to be continuing in our series on Mark. If you uh, have not been around here or you're new, if, if this is your first time, we are uh, working through Mark's Gospel. It's going to take a long time, but we're uh, going to be in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 today, and we're going to be looking at the King is here. So as always, the scripture text will be up on the screen. It's also there in your little booklet, and I encourage you to follow along in your Bible. And as always, I want to remind us, if at no other time we know that God is speaking, right now you are going to hear the word of the Lord. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. In recent days, we've all been watching uh, the events over in England as Queen Elizabeth II died and her son, who is King Charles III, is being announced as the new uh, king. And it's interesting that He's already been announced that he's the king, but he hasn't been officially coronated. There's, a, there's an announcement, and the same thing happened with Elizabeth, and for her, I think it was over a year between when she was announced and when she was actually coronated, and they went through the procedure that I mentioned just a few weeks ago, where they go behind the veil, and they're anointed with the oil, and it references back to the kings of Israel and all that. So there's an announcement that there is a new king. Uh, but then the coronation happens later. And I bring that up because we're going to see a similar pattern in the life of Jesus. In our text today, he is actually announced to be the king. His coronation is going to come later after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the right hand of the Father where he is seated as the king and ruling and reigning all things now. But just like it happened with Elizabeth II, just like it's happening with King Charles right now, there's an announcement that he is the king, and then there's kind of an official coronation that happens later. So that's what we're going to be looking at today is the fact that in Mark's gospel, the king now arrives on the scene, and he is publicly declared to be the king by none other than God the Father. So let's dive in. Notice here, with, without any kind of flourish, Mark in verse 9, we've been reading about John the Baptist last week and told John said another one's going to come. And then in the very next verse we read, at that time Jesus came. So while John is doing his ministry, while the crowds are flooding from the south in Jerusalem and Judea up to where he's at in the Jordan, we read that Jesus comes. And so you remember in, in kind of verse 1 is Mark's title and summary of the gospel. This is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And so we're, we've been ready for this Jesus to come, and all of a sudden he comes on the scene. And it's a very important moment in the gospel because, of course, we've been told this whole book's going to be about this Jesus, and this is the first time we meet him. And notice how important it is for Mark. It's heightened in his gospel because, remember, in Matthew, as Scott began our meeting this morning, you start with an infancy narrative. So you kind of get Jesus introduced, but then it's really 30 years before he really comes on the scene in public. Uh, in uh, Luke, you get the same thing, where you have even previous to the infancy narrative, you're kind of there when Jesus is conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. Um, and in John's gospel, he goes all the way back before creation and tells you who Jesus is. Mark is different. 
I mean, we've known, we don't know anything about the infancy narratives or Jesus going to the temple when he's a child. Mark has not told us that Jesus is the pre-existent second person of the Trinity as John does. It's just, boom, Jesus shows up as a full-grown man here ready to launch into his public ministry. So it's a very important moment in Mark's gospel. The guy you're thinking that the whole story is about is now on the scene. But what's a little bit shocking for us knowing who he is and who he's been declared to be in the opening verse, is that Jesus is baptized by John. Now, notice in, in Mark 1, 9, he just says, Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan. But it's surprising because why was John baptizing people? What were they doing? They were repenting and confessing their sins. But what sins does Jesus have to repent and confess? None. Okay, John is the prophet calling the people out. Jesus is the God of the prophets. Why would he come to John to get baptized? Why would the sinless son of God be baptized? Now, the interesting thing is, Mark does not overtly answer our questions now. He just kind of goes right on by that uh, as he references it. Matthew and Luke get, give more explanation, especially Matthew. Matthew tells us when he shows up to John the Baptist, what did, what did John the Baptist say when Jesus walked up? Whoa, 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 I should get baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? He points out what happens. He, and he points out that Jesus says, look, I have to do it to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, and we know that from Matthew's gospel, but again, we're mainly going to be sticking with what Mark says. Notice, Mark doesn't do that. He doesn't tell us that. Now, he does give us some hints that Jesus is distinct from the other people coming. Now, what are these? Number one, notice the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem are going out to John the Baptist. Jesus is coming from Nazareth and Galilee. Now, we don't all know our holy land geography very well, but these are exact opposite directions. The people are coming from the south to John. Jesus is coming from the north. Notice it's here the whole Judean countryside. It's masses of people are coming from the south out to the wilderness. From what we can tell, Jesus is one lone individual coming out of the north to John the Baptist. Uh, so that sets them apart. And, and we have to understand, we get this, for example, in John's gospel. What did most Jews think of Nazareth and Galilee? It's backwater. You remember Philip even said, can anything good come out of this place? Where, where was the center? I mean, if you really want to be with God, where is that? Down in Jerusalem and Judea. But interestingly, those people are having to come out and repent and confess. And notice it specifically says they were confessing their sins and repenting and being baptized by John. We don't get any note of that about Jesus. So some of this is part of Mark's motif that there's a surprise. What you would think that the holy people would be coming from Jerusalem is not true. It's actually the sinners. And you might think it's the sinners coming out of Nazareth and Galilee, but it's not. It's actually the holy Son of God that is coming out of Nazareth. And so Mark is going to keep having a motif of things being turned upside down and opposite of what the people, especially the religious leaders, think. We're going to see this theme. The religious leaders who ought to know, don't know, are often steering the people in the wrong direction, and Jesus is going to have to be correcting that constantly. So notice we'll see this, and in a minute we're going to come back and see that there are very different things that happen around Jesus' baptism to set it off. But with all that said, I want us to understand Mark is kind of using a literary motif here. He doesn't include the whole argument with John because Mark wants to unfold the story and let us wrestle with the question, who is this man? Who is he? What does it mean that he's the Son of God? He kind of wants it as it were. We're going to see the disciples several times keep saying, who is he? Even as they're following him, they're, they're wrestling. And Mark wants to let us feel a little of that tension. So he doesn't explain exactly why Jesus is, is baptized. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit some more, but he doesn't really do it because he's wanting us to say, who is this man? And if he's the king, what kind of king is he? he, he doesn't, he's not fitting my preconceived notions. So Mark does let us wrestle with this a little bit. So let's, let's dive in and look at the actual baptism and what happens and how the Father kind of sets this apart. Notice 
there, there's some unusual events that happen at Jesus' baptism. We're told as he's coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice comes from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. Now, let me state at the beginning where the NIV just has the word as. This is again that word I mentioned last week, uthus, which means immediately. And I remind you, Mark uses it 41 times, and it's only used 18 times in the entire rest of the New Testament. Mark is the gospel of immediacy. He likes to point that out. So it's not sometime after Jesus is baptized. It's literally as he's coming out of the water. I mean, he's breaking the water and coming out, and the water's dripping off of him, and he sees, and all this happens. It's an immediate event because the Father is setting it apart. So there's actually three immediate events. Number one, heaven is torn open. Number two, the Spirit descends upon Jesus. And number three, a voice from heaven rings out. So once again, this is very different because we don't hear of anything like that happening at any other water baptism John the Baptist has done. I've been privileged to baptize many, many people in water in my life, and I've never had heaven torn open, spirit descending like a dove uh, visibly, and, and a voice ring out from heaven. Just have, so this is a different baptism because the Father is wanting to say, don't misunderstand what's happening here. And, and it's actually the entire trinity is involved in doing this. I'm not going to unpack this this morning just out of time, but after hours, which you can get either off of our website, uh, we have links to it in the bridge, or you can um, uh, actually look, we put it on our Facebook page stuff, the, the little after hours video that I'll make this afternoon is going to describe how the Trinity is involved in the water baptism, how we see the Trinity in this text, and part of why that is so important for us. But that's in the director's cut of the, of the teaching here today. So you can, you can dig in for that. But let's look at these three events. Number one, Mark uses this interesting term that Jesus comes up and he sees heaven being torn open. Now the old King James uh, just says that it, it, it's open. But the actual word here is the word that, it's the word from which we get our word schism, to tear something apart. And interestingly, it's only used two times in Mark's gospel. And both times it's used to declare that Jesus is the Son of God. It's used here, and then it's used on the day of the crucifixion in Mark 15, 38, when we read that the, the veil in the temple is torn apart. Exact same word as is used as here. And it's the only two times Mark uses it. Here at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, and then at the climax of Jesus' public ministry, and both times it's the Father saying, pay attention to what's going on. This is my son. And so it's really, really interesting. It's also important for us to understand, we've been mentioning that Mark, remember, begins by quoting from Isaiah and how much he's not always going to quote the Old Testament for us, but all of it is built there and especially out of Isaiah. Well, Isaiah, as he was prophesying about the new exodus and the new covenant community, this is Isaiah's prayer in Isaiah 64.1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, that you would tear the heavens apart and come down. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to answer that prayer. Isaiah prayed this over 700 years before, and God is going to answer it. And don't miss, I'm going to show you now the previous verses. Remember, there were originally no chapters and verse numbers. In Isaiah 63, in the closing verses, here's what we read. Speaking of the people of Israel, yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is involved here as the heavens are rent. So he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Then his people recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them through the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? So notice we have we have that the people are, have been delivered in an exodus from Egypt. They are out in the wilderness. They go through the water, and, but the problem is they sin and they grieve the Holy Spirit. But here we have Jesus, the new Israel, in the wilderness there to effect a new exodus for the people of God. He goes through the water, comes up out of the water, and the Spirit uh, descends because He's not disobeying the Father. He's being obedient 
to the Father. And so he's not grieving the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is pleased to dwell on him. These are the verses in Isaiah 63. And Isaiah is saying, this people, we, we have been rebellious again and again. You delivered us from Egypt and we rebelled and we grieved your Holy Spirit. And he's prophesying now about a new exodus that's going to happen. But the problem is, is the people remain in sin. And so in the very next verse, Isaiah says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And here in Mark's gospel, we see that the heavens are rent. They are torn apart and God does come down to uh, rest upon the Messiah in the person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus here, the true Israel, is going through the waters, but unlike the old Israel, because we're going to see next week, this, this motif's going to continue, Jesus is going to go into the wilderness and be tested and tempted. So just like Israel came through the water and was tested and tempted, Jesus is going to do it, but the difference is Israel was disobedient. They were disobedient over and over again. They rebelled against God. They were grieving the Holy Spirit, but here we're already seeing Jesus comes through the water, the Spirit descends upon him, and the Father says he is pleased with Jesus. So the tearing open of the heavens is a sign that Jesus is the true Israel, that Jesus is the Messiah. And what that means is the king is here. He's being announced. That's the first sign. But God's going to reiterate it three times here. Pay attention. God doesn't stutter. When he does something three times, he wants to see it. The second point then is not only the heavens torn open, we see the spirit descending like a dove. Now, of course, we just saw in Isaiah 63 where they had grieved the Holy Spirit, but the, the Spirit is descending upon Jesus showing he's the Messiah. Because remember, what does the word Messiah or Christ mean? Anointed, okay? When they rubbed oil on the head of the king, he became a Mashiach, one who was anointed. But all those were just types and shadows. The Messiah was the one who was not going to be anointed with oil. He's going to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. So that which was symbol is now reality. And we see this that uh, again in Isaiah. If you go back, you can read Mark Strong so much upon Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 11, where Isaiah is giving a, pro a prophecy regarding the coming Messiah, he says this, a shoot will come up from the stump of Desi uh, Jesse. Notice in Revelation this morning, out of what David read in Revelation 5, Jesus is called the root of David, okay? It's coming out of this text. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And so this is a messianic passage. What's interesting, I won't take the time to, to go, go into it, but whenever you're reading about this shoot coming out of the stump of Jesse, and especially the phrase, the branch, the branch is used in Isaiah 4.2, in Zechariah 3.8, in Zechariah 6.12, and in Jeremiah 23, verse 5. And every time it's referencing the Messiah, this branch that is going to come. It looked like David's line was cut off, but it was not cut off. So again, that's in, you can get these off the notes on the website, but it's Isaiah 4, 2, Zechariah 3, 8, Zechariah 6, 12, and Jeremiah 23, 5. We may not be familiar. We don't very often talk about Jesus as the branch, but it's used in the prophets a lot, and it's referencing the Messiah. But notice, what sets the Messiah apart? The Spirit is upon him. And notice, we're told that he is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of power, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Y'all help me. Seven times, what is seven reference in the Scripture? It's the fullness, the completeness. He's not getting the dab of the, the Holy Spirit is upon him him okay now this is referencing because jesus is fully god but he's also fully man and as the human messiah the the fully god fully man messiah he's being anointed by the holy spirit which is a sign that he is in fact the messiah and so and it's the fullness of the holy spirit that is coming and that becomes important because remember jesus is going to baptize his people in the holy spirit and 
uh, Peter says on the day of Pentecost, look, Jesus is the Messiah. He's received the Holy Spirit and poured the Spirit out, and he pours him out in fullness. And that's what had been prophesied regarding the Messiah. So what this means is the descent of the Spirit is the public sign that Jesus is the Messiah. It's the second way that God is announcing the King is here. The one you've been waiting for, really, since Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. He is here. Third thing is the voice from heaven that certifies Jesus' identity. Notice in verse 11, a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. So this is, this is the clearest certification. This voice booms out of heaven, and God actually says three separate things regarding Jesus here in this third sign, if you will. Number one, you are my son. This is a phrase out of Psalm 2, verse 7, which is a messianic psalm. The whole psalm is about how the kings of the earth rebel against the Messiah, And in verse 7, we're told, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Now, all the Davidic kings were called, but again, they were only a type and a shadow. The real son is the eternal son of God. And so he is the messianic king, and he declares that the Messiah is his son. In Psalm 2, It begins by referring to him as the Messiah, then it moves to referring to him as the Son of God. And so here we're learning that God declares the Messiah is his Son, and not just in a type and shadow sense, but he is the true Son. So God the Father here is saying, this is the Father's public certification that Jesus is his Son. Remember Mark's Gospel began with, I'm telling you the story of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Well, We only have to get down to verse 11, and God himself has declared that's who Jesus is. But it's not only that he is his son, you are the son whom I love. Now what's interesting to me, and I was surprised by this as I was digging in and studying the text, this actually comes out of Genesis 22, verse 2. This is where Abraham is being told to sacrifice Isaac. And God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Now what's interesting is the actual phrase that's identical to what the Father is saying to Jesus here is not whom you love, it's your only son. It's the same phrase. The reason that they translate it your only son is because it sounds weird to us in English to say uh, the, the son of your love whom you love. But that's literally what it says. The son whom you love, whom you love, is the way that it's put there. So what they say is it's, it's a way of saying this is your unique son. Okay, you've got Ishmael, but this is the son of the promise. This is your unique son, and he's doing it. So it's usually translated your only son in Genesis because it's being followed by the phrase whom you love. And so your beloved son whom you love sounds weird to us, but, but it's the same phrase that the father speaks here. So as Isaac was Abraham's son, the son of promise, who Abraham loved, and who was the heir of his father. God the Father is now saying, this is my only son. This is the son who I love. This is the one who is heir of all my promises. It's exactly what's going on there in Genesis 22. And interestingly, this phrase is repeated verbatim one other time in Mark's gospel at the transfiguration. When a voice is going to boom out of heaven and say, this is my son whom I love. And it kind of rebuked Peter who's running off at the mouth, be quiet and listen. Okay? So the same phrase is used there, which again is when Jesus is deity and power. See, because what happens is the first half of the book, we're with the disciples, we're saying, who is this man? At the end of Mark 8, Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the very next event is the transfiguration. And the father says, you're right. I told you that at his baptism. I'm telling you that again. But now what has been veiled, you see clearly for just a moment. You see him in his power and his glory. And so the father does it. Now, what's interesting here is This phrase, again, coming from Abraham, because God was telling Abraham, you need to go up and sacrifice Isaac. But what happened in that story? Did Abraham sacrifice Isaac? Isaac was delivered. 
But for those of us who know the rest of the gospel, is Jesus going to be delivered? He's going to be sacrificed. What God did not require of Abraham, he is going to do himself. His son, his only son, the son whom he loves is going to be sacrificed. And there's foreshadowing here. Now, the people standing there, they they don't fully get, but Jesus knows what's going on. And he realizes that the Father loves him, but this time there will be no ram caught in the thicket. The Son is the ram caught in the thicket. So the Father says that. Now the third thing is the Father says, with you I am well pleased. This doesn't have a direct quote from the Old Testament, but the text that's closest, the same idea, is again in Isaiah. Isaiah 42 verse 1. And God is speaking that there's going to be this new exodus and it's going to be accomplished by the servant of the Lord. And here's what the Lord says in Isaiah 42, 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him. Do you hear all the same phrases that we see happening here? I'll put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. So the Father is here saying at Jesus' baptism, he is pleased with Jesus. He, it's a fulfillment of the statement that he's going to delight in the servant of the Lord and, and the Spirit is going to come and rest on him, exactly like we see in Mark's Gospel. And so here, the Father is giving Jesus his public approval and certification as he begins his ministry to bring justice to the nations. Because see, here's the good news. The the justice of God, which could be bad news for you and me, is good news because Jesus has fulfilled all righteousness. Because he has fully done the will and the word and the law of God, he has accomplished it in our behalf. And he does it not just for Israel, it's for the nations. It's for all nations, which has been God's plan from the beginning, what Israel was supposed to do. So this voice from heaven is certifying that Jesus is the beloved son who is pleasing to the father. The king is here. Now, here's a wild thing just as a sideline, and then we'll go into applying the word. This threefold testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the heavens being opened, the Spirit descending like a dove, and a voice from heaven had actually been spoken about. This is in the Testament of Levi, which is from about 250 B.C. This is not something Christians wrote afterwards. This is what Jews had written saying, this is what it's going to be like when the Messiah comes. The heavens will be opened, and from the temple of glory, sanctification will come upon him with a fatherly voice as from Abraham to Isaac, and the glory of the Most High shall burst forth upon him, and the spirit of understanding and sanctification shall rest upon him. And then some manuscripts have the phrase, in the water, and some don't. For he shall give the majesty of the Lord to those who are his sons in truth forever. Do you, do you hear? This sounds like something Christians wrote after the baptism of Jesus, but it's not because what they're doing is they're just reflecting on these Old Testament texts and they're saying, "Oh, well, the Messiah is like Isaac. He's the he's the one that's loved. He's like David. He's anointed. The Spirit rests on him. It's the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. We know that from Isaiah. They're just blending these texts together, but it's pretty interesting that this was 250 years before the time of Christ. Be paying attention to this, Israel. Look, the day's going to come. There's going to be somebody in the water, and when they're in the water, the heavens are going to open. The Father is going to speak. The Spirit is going to descend on them, and that's exactly what happens in the Jordan that day in the wilderness. God is certifying to his people. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. The king you've been waiting for is here. So that's the message. Now, how do we apply that? What does that mean for you and me? There's two parts. Number one, do we see how Jesus identifies with sinners? Again, Mark is subtle at first, but Jesus' baptism is unique. 
But we do know from Matthew's gospel, Jesus is going in not because he has sins of his own to confess, sins of his own to repent from, sins of his own to wash away in the water, so to speak. He's doing it because you and I do. And so there's actually two parts that theologians speak of, of what Jesus does for us and how atonements work. We most often talk about what they refer to as the passive obedience of Christ, that Jesus dies on the cross and his blood can atone for our sins. And are we grateful for that? Absolutely. But if all that was needed was for Jesus to die on the cross and pay for our sins, then why wasn't he just incarnated on the cross? Why 33 years? Why three years of public ministry? That's because there's also the active obedience of Christ. See, we have a twofold problem. We have sin that has to be washed away and has to be paid for, but we also have to positively obey the law of God. And how many of us have done that? None. None. Not even one. And so if all Jesus did was his passive obedience and paying for our sin, you and I would be right back where Adam was in the garden. Somebody help me out here. I'm a little rusty on this. How well did that end? We need the active obedience of Christ. And so Jesus comes to John the Baptist, and John's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But Jesus says, see, we have to fulfill all righteousness. And I have come not to push the people away. I have come to identify with my people. I come to identify. I'm right now going into the waters of baptism to identify with the fact that they need to be baptized because they have sinned, but I'm even going to do more than that. I am going to work righteousness for them, and on the cross, I'm actually going to take their sin. Okay? I'm not going to go a lot into it, but if you remember, one of the events surrounding the Day of Atonement is there's two goats. One goat you put your hands on, and they slay it, the blood pays, and the other goat, the scapegoat, you put your hands on it, put your sins on it, and where does the goat go? Out into the wilderness. Where's Jesus going to go as soon as he walks out of the water? Out into the wilderness. The day of atonement has come. Jesus identifies with us. He has fulfilled God's call, God's law, God's word, God's will perfectly. And that righteousness is given to everyone who looks to him in faith. So see, friends, you and I are the people that Isaiah cries about. I mean, I remember coming up out of the water. Unfortunately, like Israel, in the wilderness, I have rebelled. I have grieved the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was obedient in my place. This is the gospel. So I encourage you to recognize that and think of how he has identified for you, and not just the passive obedience, but the active obedience. J. Gresham Machen, um, a great theologian who lived in the early 20th century that was fighting for the truth of the Word of God, uh, actually was the, the founder of Westminster Theological Seminary up in Philadelphia. When Machen was dying as a young man, the last words he wrote is, I am so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. There is no hope apart from it. That Jesus didn't just die for my sins, he lived because of my sins. And he went into those waters of baptism, certainly as an example, but not just as an example. He's fulfilling all righteousness. What the Father says, the Son does. And that obedience is given to me. So that, friends, is what it is. He has no sin. He fully obeys God's commands so that my sins could be forgiven and his righteousness could be given to me. That is the gospel. He who had no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He wears my sin. I wear his righteousness. That is good news. That is good news. Now the second question is, have I responded to Christ the King? God gave a threefold testimony. Okay, a threefold testimony that Jesus is the King. But I want us to think for just a moment because, you know, we've been watching this stuff go on over in England, right? Why aren't we watching our own King being crowned here in America? 
because we don't have one, right? And not saying that a constitutional monarchy is better than our constitutional republic. But I do want to push back on our age a little bit. And this is true even in England. Our age is defined by the autonomous will. It is the triumph of the will. What matters is what I want. We want no king but our own. Uh, Us, me, myself. What I want is what's on the throne. And that is built completely into our culture. Just turn on the news and listen to what people say. It is constantly about I get to do what I want. Nobody has the right to tell me. And the second we do that, we are off into deep, deep trouble. This week, listen to how often you hear the language of autonomy, self-government, my free choice, self-determination, freedom from any restraint to be who I want, love who I want, act how I want. And I encourage you then to go read in Isaiah 14 about the fall of Satan. Because those words, see, Satan said, I will. I'm going to ascend. I'm going to do what I want. I will sit in the place of the Most High. And that sounds an awful lot like our age. We, we, have, we have made the human will central. The only thing that matters is what I want. But see, the king has come And he commands us all to embrace his rule. And paradoxically, for human beings created in the image of God, freedom comes not from self-determination, but from submitting to and embracing the rule of the king. That's how you become free. The other path is actually slavery. Because we are created as a certain type of of being. You can go back and listen, I think think it was last year, or maybe it was two years ago. Uh, No, it was last year. Uh, In 2021, we went through during Lent, we looked at the freedom of limits. We did a whole series talking about this, where you go back. You and I are made in such a way. See, it's it's not bondage for a fish to be in the water. That's how they're made. It's bondage when they get out on the land. And they can say, I identify as an air-breathing mammal, but they're not. And all they're going to do is flop around and gasp until they die. They were created for the water. You and I were created for certain limitations that actually unleash our potential, that actually give us freedom, that actually allow us to experience true life. And ignoring those limitations is the same as a fish saying, I'm going to crawl up on the land instead of swimming in the water. It's actually death. So what we're called to do is if you are here and you've never become a believer, you are not saved, as I've been saying this morning, you're not saved by your works. We're saved by what Jesus has done. But we do exactly what we did here. We embrace the king by faith, and then we get baptized as a public profession of that faith. If you have never either embraced Jesus by faith, I urge you to do that today. If you've never been water baptized, come talk to me. We've got a water baptism coming up. I encourage you, let's get baptized. Follow our king in doing that. But for all of us, if you are a believer, if you're sitting here and you're saying, you know, yes, I I repented and got baptized. I mean, for me, it was in 1978, long time ago that I repented and got baptized, I still have to embrace the king by submitting to his law for my own good. See, this is why Jesus said, come to you who labor and are weary laden and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy. See, our culture says, I don't want no yoke. Well, not having the yoke of Jesus is heavy. Having the yoke of Jesus is light. Our culture wants to deny that, but the more we do it, it's like one of those, you know, the little, what do they call the little Chinese finger traps? You know, you put your finger in, and the more you pull, the tighter it gets. That's what our culture is doing right now, and the more we're doing it, the more we're getting wrapped up in ourselves, and there is no freedom in 
that. Freedom is found in the fact that Jesus identified with you and I as sinners, and the response is we identify with him as our king and say, yes, I want to be your loyal servant. So what we're going to do is we're now going to come to the table of the king. And we're going to do two parts here at the table. Number one, we're going to celebrate our king's work in our behalf, that he identified with us. He has come and won the victory for us. But number two, in a sacrament, we also are freshly renewing our vows, as it were, and offering ourselves fresh and new back to our king. And we're going to do that as well this morning as we go through with these elements. So I want to remind us all that this is a meal for believers. And you do not have to be a member of this local congregation. If you are a member of the body of Christ, because you recognize your sin, you know that you have no hope apart from the grace and mercy of God. And your only hope of salvation is through Jesus Christ. If you believe that, you are welcome at this table. If you don't believe that, if you are trusting in your own righteousness, you're not even sure if there is a God, then this is not a meal. You should let the, don't, don't participate. But if you do believe it, I want to encourage us to come to the table today. And again, I remind us, uh, this is the table that the king has spread for us. Kings had tables where they invited just the select few to sit around them. Our king is very different. He invites us all to sit and eat and drink with him. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to take just a moment for us to be silent and for you to meditate upon the fact that Christ identified with you, has fulfilled all righteousness in your place, all he's done for you, and then to let the Spirit work in us and say, is there any area, Lord, that I need to hand over to you? Uh, search me, as it says in the Psalms. See if there's any way that's wrong in me, and let me hand that over to you. Jesus, we give you thanks for your active, positive obedience in our place. You took our flesh and fulfilled the Father's will in all things so that you might be righteous in our place, fully satisfying the demands of the holy law. And we receive this bread today in faith, full of gratitude that in you we are made the very righteousness of God. Brothers and sisters, take and eat. Lord Jesus, we are not only thankful for your active obedience, but your passive obedience upon the cross. We give you thanks for your atoning work in our behalf. For though you were spotless and sinless, perfect in every way, you bore the wrath that we deserved, suffering death on the cross, fully atoning for our sins. We receive this cup today in faith, full of gratitude that in you our sins have been forever washed away. Brothers and sisters, take and drink. If you can stand with me, and as I pray a prayer of us being consecrated and responding to the grace of God, I encourage you to pray out of your own heart for God to work in us. Lord, at this table of the King, we have celebrated the work of Jesus in our place. Lord, we have tasted and seen that you are good. 
that you are full of compassion and mercy. And so, Lord, in response, strengthened by the grace we have received through word and sacrament, we now renew our vow to be your disciples. Lord, by your word, renew our minds. Lord, by your grace, form and fashion our wills. Lord, empower us by the same Spirit who descended upon Jesus at his baptism so that we might be conformed to his image and serve his purposes and his kingdom in the earth today. Lord, we ask that you would do all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus, our King. And God's people say, Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, receive the blessing of your King. Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come and from the sevenfold Spirit before His throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you are covered in the righteousness of God. You are blessed. Go forth and be a blessing. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.